Tonight, Comcast accuses merger opponents of extortion. Amazon might be building smart home devices. And the mess that Apple created with iOS 8.0.1. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 179 for Wednesday, September 24th, 2014. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Comcast has accused Netflix and Discovery Communications and other companies that oppose the company's deal, $45 billion proposed deal to acquire Time Warner Cable. Uh, Comcast says that they're failing at extortion attempts to get special favors. Now, this is in response to comments that were filed over the summer by a variety of companies who oppose this deal. Comcast told regulators today that the complaints, quote, are even more unfounded here because many of them are only being made because Comcast refused to grant various self-interested requests soon after the Time Warner cable deal was announced, such as free backbone interconnection and wholesale agreements and... As Comcast puts it, many requests to agree to carry networks that do not even exist yet. Discovery and Netflix have already publicly denied Comcast's extortion charges. In a statement today, Netflix argues, quote, It is not extortion to demand that Comcast provide its own customers the broadband speeds they've paid for so they can enjoy Netflix. It is extortion when Comcast fails to provide its own customers the broadband speed they've paid for unless Netflix also pays a ransom. People just can't get along in the cable industry. Reuters is reporting that Amazon is hiring employees at its Silicon Valley-based hardware unit called Lab 126, kind of mysterious place, by at least 27% over the next five years and plans to boost its full-time payroll to about 3,700 people by 2019. Reuters is citing an agreement the company reached with California back in June that would give Amazon a $1.2 million tax break. People familiar with the company's plans tell Reuters that Lab 126 may test internet-connected smart home gadgets such as a one-button device to order supplies. Specifically, Amazon is reportedly testing a Wi-Fi device that could be put in a kitchen or maybe a closet, allowing customers to order products like detergent by pressing that button and might also be interested in wearable devices along with every other company in the world. Lab 126 projects include the 2007 debut of the first Kindle e-reader and the recently launched Fire Phone. So, you know, some hits and some misses there. BlackBerry's new handset, speaking of, well, I'll let you be the judge. The Passport went on sale today at BlackBerry's website and at Amazon with an off-contract price of $599. That's, of course, lower than the iPhone 6, the 6 Plus, and the Samsung Galaxy 5S which it's going after. AT&T announced it will also offer the smartphone, but hasn't announced pricing or availability yet. The Passport is unique that it has a square shape at 4.5 inches with a 1440 by 1440 pixel touch screen. The square screen is 30% wider than the average five inch smartphone, allowing it to display 60 characters across compared to 40 characters on a regular five inch device or a more common one anyway. Though some reviewers have already complained the phone is just too wide. The Passport ships running the latest version of BlackBerry's OS 10.3, which includes a new voice-controlled BlackBerry Assistant. And as always, the company touts the Passport security as a strong point, including remote lock and wipe, control over app permissions, and data encryption. Samsung has announced that its upcoming Tizen-based smartwatch, the Gear S, which the company announced back in August, will go on sale later this fall at Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. The Gear S will have a 2-inch curved AMOLED display, support for 2G and 3G wireless networks, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth hardware. The watch will house a 1 gigahertz processor, 512 megabytes of RAM, and have a 300 milliamp battery designed to last up to two days. Still no word on price. Pricing, though, and that's really one of the most important parts. Shipping company DHL has announced that on Friday it will begin piloting drone deliveries with a fleet of what it calls parcel copters 
to a German island in the North Sea called Juist, which I just learned existed. It has no cars, but it does have a population of around 1,700 people. So drone flights will take place when other aircraft and ferries aren't operating. The parcel copter can travel up to 65 kilometers per hour. Drone testing is kind of all the rage these days. Google recently completed a series of drone deliveries in Australia, and Amazon said back in April that it was working on its seventh generation drone prototype. Oh, but let's not forget about Facebook when we talk about drones. Speaking on Monday during a talk at the Social Good Summit in New York City, engineering director of Facebook's new connectivity lab, Yael McGuire, said of the company's work on its own drones, quote, we're going to have to push the edge of solar technology, battery technology, and composite technology. The connectivity lab was established earlier this year with a goal to build and launch a fleet of solar-powered drones that could connect billions of people that are currently living off the grid of the internet. In order to fly its drones for months or even years, though, at a time, McGuire says that they'll have to fly above weather and above all airspace. Now, airspace is anywhere from 60,000 to 90,000 feet in the air. And that, quote, all the rules exist for satellites and we're invested in those. They play a very useful role, but we also have to help pave new ground. Interesting. Coming up, kind of a drone extravaganza today. What is the punishment? For somebody who crashes their drone into a lake at Yellowstone National Park, the answer will surprise you. But joining me now is Tim Stevens, editor-at-large over at CNET. Hello, Tim. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So did you have, uh, well, first of all, are you an iPhone user? Do you have a, what, what are the new uh, Apple iPhone models? Yeah, I've been playing with both the 6 and the 6 Plus, mostly the 6 Plus for the past couple of weeks. And uh, so far, I've somehow managed to not bend it yet. You know, I, okay, I've got mine too. I've only had it for a couple of days and my pockets aren't big enough to sit on it really. But I got to say, <laughs> this thing is, it's so ginormous. I just feel ridiculous at all times. Well, I've been using a, a Note 3 for a long time and I had a Note 2 before that. So for me, it feels pretty natural. In fact, yeah. the, uh, you know, the, the older, the 5-inch, excuse me, the 4-inch 5 uh, felt a little bit too small for me. So actually, it's nice to have an iPhone that I think is a, a good size for, for my size hands anyway. Maybe I'm just living in the wrong city. I feel like I'm just a walking, you know, advertisement. Please rob me. It's so big. <laughs> I'm not really holding Especially it very securely. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about iOS 8.0.1, uh, which was a complete disaster this morning. I sort of woke up to a lot of people having meltdowns that Touch ID was no longer working. They couldn't make phone calls. What happened? Yeah, I actually got lucky. It dropped right around lunchtime here on the East Coast, and I was actually preparing some food. And by the time I came back, Twitter was just a light with people complaining about how it had disabled the cellular connection of their phone and Touch ID. Uh, but yeah, basically, 8.0.1 dropped today uh, with some updates to bring uh, to make health get ready and to do some other things as well, take care of some other little issues that people were having, uh, but in turn uh, delivered a lot of bigger issues. So yeah, disabled the cellular connection for a lot of people, so phones were not able to connect. Some people also were not able to connect on Wi-Fi after updating, which meant your phone was really pretty much useless at that point. And of course, with Touch ID uh, being disabled, that meant it uh, will be a a little bit harder to sign into your phone too. So uh, really bad news, really bad update. It only lasted maybe an hour, maybe 90 minutes uh, before right. Apple pulled it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how long it lasted, but no more than 90 minutes anyway. Uh, Apple pulled it offline. Uh, and if you did get 8.0.1, you can roll back. Uh, if you may need to connect to your laptop and do a reversion that way, but uh, it's going to take a while, but I would highly recommend it. No word yet on exactly what went wrong, how this version got pushed out, or when Apple is going to push out 8.0.2, I presume. Yeah, no, I mean, it, for me, because I'm excited about a new operating system, I really feel like iOS 8 just doesn't feel done. You know, the, the health kit issue yeah. when iOS 8 went live to a lot of us and then all of a sudden the health kit app was pulled, there was an issue with it, which obviously affected third-party apps as well that, 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 that work with health kit. That already seemed really sloppy to me. It, right. it's, and, I mean, is this, do, do you feel like this is more of a sloppy rollout for iOS than in the past? Or am I just having buyer's remorse for having such a large phone? <laughs> <laughs> that may be part of it. I think a lot of people are feeling that way too. Uh, I mean, we always see some issues with a new major revision of iOS. So we certainly saw that some things with iOS 7 as well. What's odd is how this this update got pushed out uh, with this many issues. That's that's strange that they would push out a point release like this with seemingly so little testing. I, I'm honestly wondering if maybe it wasn't supposed to get pushed out and somebody clicked the wrong button in their QA department. Uh, I honestly don't know, um, but uh, you know, it's not, 
not it's not a good sign, especially you know it's a bit of a double black eye with all the Ben Gates stuff going on right now too. Um, so you know it, it is a pretty big version of iOS 8, so you got to expect some issues in there, but they definitely do seem to be a lot of problems. You mentioned BendGate. BendGate, of course, referring to the issue that some users are having where I, I guess you're sitting on your phone and there's enough pressure that then the phone is bending. Uh, now, the 6 Plus, I, I kind of get that, Tim, because it's just, you know, it takes up so much room, but it's, but it's quite thin. I can see where that happens. Right. You think the 6 has the same uh, potential issues, though? I've only seen actually a handful of actual reported instances of this happening online. I've done a lot of digging today to try to get to the root of exactly how big of an issue this is. And I've only found about six actual instances of this happening. Uh, it's probably split between the six and, and the six plus. But from what I can tell, the majority of the time, it's actually people putting the phone in their front pocket, mm. wearing jeans. Uh, and when they sit down, the phone pokes out of the top of the pocket a, a little bit. And that strap, you know, basically forming the top of the pocket puts a lot of pressure in the middle of the phone, which is its weakest point, effectively. So when you sit down, that crease right there basically pulls in on the phone, and that causes the damage. But I've only seen maybe six instances of this actually happening. So I'm, you know, not exactly convinced this is as widespread an issue as a lot of people are making it out to be. Tim Stevens is editor-at-large over at CNET. Thanks so much for joining us, Tim, and offering a little bit more insight on what Apple's thinking. Always happy to be here. <laughs> Finally, okay, so we mentioned it was a drone extravaganza today. Let's let's talk about what happened at Yellowstone. You crash your drone into a national park, apparently you get in trouble. Andreas Meisner has been sentenced to a year of probation that's in his native country of Germany. A one-year ban from Yellowstone National Park, which is in Wyoming, uh, the U.S., and a $1,600 fine after pleading guilty to illegally flying a drone and then crashing it into a lake in the park, which was back in July. Now, back in June, the U.S.'s National Park Service banned drones in all parks following an initial ban in California's Yosemite National Park. Now, Meisner says he didn't realize that. Rangers are currently trying to find the drone, which is still in the lake. The court's judgment stipulates that both the drone and the camera, which was attached to it, will be returned upon payment of the fine. $1,600. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'll be back here same time tomorrow. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.